and Corey Benfield is going to be talking about building protocol libraries the right way. So let's give a big hand for Corey. All right. Thank you all for uh, showing up for the most boringly named talk of the conference and getting over the fact it's the last talk of the day. Hello, uh, my name is Corey. That, that was just too tragic. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, my name is Corey. Uh, I'm a software developer. I'm based in London. Uh, if you would like to give running commentary of this talk or tweet abuse, I'm available at various places. You can go find things. Uh, I live on the interwebs most of the time. Uh, I work at Hewlett Packard Enterprise. Uh, I work in Hewlett Packard Enterprise's kind of open source focused upstream team. Uh, and for my part, that means that overwhelmingly I work on uh, open source Python HTTP. This covers a really quite broad range of responsibilities, but the ones I spend the most time on are uh, some of the things on the board, uh, the ones you're likely to know. Uh, requests is obviously pretty famous. Uh, that's the one I spend a, a large chunk of time on, but I also spend a lot of time on urllib3, which is the uh, project underlying requests. It's probably the most important Python project that none of you have heard of. Uh, on top of that, I work on the Python Hyper project, which is actually a, a collection of projects uh, that are useful for HTTP and HTTP2. They've got a whole lot of collection of fairly boring names. We're going to touch on a couple of them a little bit later. Uh, then, on top of all of that, uh, for my sins, I am also a contributor to PyOpenSSL, uh, which is a library that I think most of the contributors to would be quite happy to see the back of. <laughs> so this talk's got a terrible name, and that's because it used to have a great name that I decided was altogether too confrontational. So its original name was going to be... <laughs> <laughs> but you can't... You can't put that on a program, right? You get angry tweets if you put that on a program. People think you're being snotty. Uh, but while this title's super inflammatory, I, it does highlight something I wanted to focus on, which is, uh, in this talk, I'm going to cover uh, a design anti-pattern that the entire community uh, engages in every time we build protocol libraries. And it's really easy when giving that kind of talk to feel like uh, the speaker is all holier than thou and aren't I wonderful and smart. Uh, and that's not what I'm saying. I'm terrible. I am stupider than most of you. I do this wrong all the time, uh, and I only got it right by chance once. So my success rate is not good. So context. Python HTTP is great. I think we can all agree, as a community, we've got a whole lot of really great tools for working with HTTP in Python. We've got really awesome client libraries. Uh, even if we wanted to pretend that requests was not a really awesome client library, which it is, uh, there are still a huge number of other great client libraries floating around in uh, Python land and built on top of requests. So for example, HTTPy, uh, which some of you probably don't know, uh, one of the great tools lurking in the Python community that people don't really use. Uh, and then on top of that, we've got great pure Python web servers like GUnicorn. We've got great web frameworks, asynchronous web frameworks like AIO HTTP and Twisted and Tornado. And essentially, we've just got things that cover pretty much the broad range of possible uses you could have. If you want something that's really easy to use and makes a lot of decisions for you, we've got you covered. If you want something that's super low level, where you can control everything and do crazy wacky stuff, we've got you covered there too. And all of these libraries are great, and we love them all, and they all have uh, one problem, well, they've all got more than one problem, but they all have one common problem, uh, which is that they don't share code. Uh, the pedants in the audience will now be pointing out that that's trivially untrue. They're all Python libraries, so they all at the very least share some, uh, the Python interpreter and also you know, the collections library. They probably all use the collections library, at least an abstract base class or something. Um, but that's kind of trivial and not what I'm interested in. Um, there's another case that's fairly obvious, which is some of them wrap each other. Uh, request is a wrapper for urllib3, so obviously they share some code. Uh, but that also misses my core point. What I mean is they don't share any uh, interesting code beyond the Python standard library or the trivial wrapping cases. Now, this is kind of odd, because as software professionals, we've all had beaten into us from the start of our career that code reuse 
is great. Like, code reuse is one of the core principles uh, behind why people uh, share, uh, uh, try to sell open uh, object-oriented code, rather. Uh, it's considered to be one of the, the great examples of code design is when you can reuse code as much as possible. Again, this is only sometimes true, but mostly we can say with 100% certainty that code reuse is great when it comes to well-defined problems with clear scope and correct results. For example, consider arithmetic, addition. There is no reason to write your own addition code, right? There's no reason to sit down and implement the microcode that is inside a CPU to do addition because addition has one right answer. When you add two numbers together, there's only one acceptable answer to come out of that. That's huge. So when you've got a problem like that, you want to avoid reinventing wheels in production code. There's obviously lots of value in reinventing wheels to teach yourself something, but if you're trying to sell a product or build something for people to use, you want to avoid reinventing wheels. There are a couple of really important examples of problems that are like this, that are well-defined, that have a really clearly defined scope and one correct answer. Some examples that we, we deal with a lot in non-trivial code are things like file formats, parsing a file format, uh, parsing XML, for example. There's one correct answer for parsing XML. Uh, compression algorithms, uh, and network protocol parsers. I, re I mentioned network protocol parsers for two reasons. The first one is that that's what I do uh, in my job, so that's what I think about all the time. But I also talk about it because uh, the goal of a network protocol is to be able to talk to a different computer somewhere far away. And to do that, you have to both agree on what the message means. If you disagree on what the message means, you're not communicating in a way that's very helpful. You're, the, the advantage of having a network protocol is lost, and you may as well just write a letter to someone because they've got about the same chance of getting it right as that random computer did. So with that in mind, given that there is one and only one correct way to parse an HTTP message, why do all of our HTTP libraries have their own parsing code? There is an answer to this, of course, and the answer to this is that all of these libraries do their own I.O., and worse than that, they mix their I.O. into their parsing code. I'm going to pick a couple of, of basic examples. HTTP lib in the Python standard library. HTTP lib has got a parser, and it's got a state machine, and it's got socket calls. And in a library that was really cleanly well designed, you would be able to separate each of these out into their own components pretty easily. You'd be able to grab the state machine and the protocol parser and yank that out and just be left with socket calls. But that's not how HTTP lib is actually designed. HTTP lib's parser is actually more or less implicit. It's broken up by socket calls that read and write in a slightly confusing way and that actually enforce the correctness of the library. If you don't have those socket calls there or if you change the way they behave, HTTP lib can get quite a lot of things quite wrong. This is a problem. The various async modules like AIO, HTTP, and Tornado and Twisted, um, they're usually slightly better at this, but then they compound it with a different mistake. So having dodged that bullet, they then tend to mix their concurrency primitives in instead. If you go back into AIO HTTP, for example, uh, you will frequently find that AIO HTTP uh, uses uh, async IO's concurrency primitives, which don't necessarily interoperate very well with the concurrency primitives of the other libraries. This gets, again, even worse if you think about asynchronous tools that aren't like those. For example, if I added slash g event to the end of that list, then g events uh, HTTP stuff is very G event specific. You can't very easily yank it out. And this leads to a problem. In the Python ecosystem, it means that the way you want to do I.O. limits the Python libraries you can use. Or if you have structured it the other way and you're like a request zealot, uh, wanting to use requests means there are certain things you can't do. You can't necessarily say, I want to use requests in Tornado. You can, but you're going to fork out to a thread, and then you know, there's no point doing Tornado anymore. You can just have threads. It's fine. So, assuming you all grant me that that's a problem, which you might not, in which case the rest of this talk is going to be tough for you, <laughs> why does this problem matter? So we've got lots of HTTP parsers. Big deal. Who cares? Well, there are some real problems about it. The first one is we're wasting our time. We're wasting our time. We're duplicating effort. When the people who wrote AIO HTTP wanted to write that, they wanted a great 
AI, async IO HTTP library, did they need to write a new parser as part of that job? Are they adding something to the world with their parser? And the answer is no. Of course not. The parser is boring. There is only so good an HTTP parser can be. At a certain point, you're not getting anything new out of it. So they didn't want to write that. They just had to write that. There was nothing else there for them to use. Speaking for the URL lib3 team, we use HTTP lib for our parser. We're not happy about that. I don't think anyone's ever happy about that. <laughs> Every time someone builds a new HTTP library in Python, you have to write a new parser because you can't get any out of the ones that are already there. This is effort you shouldn't have to spend and that no one wants to spend. There's just nothing fun about writing a parser. Trust me, it's what I do. But because of this, because you have to write a parser to build a new HTTP library, it's harder to experiment with building HTTP libraries. There are interesting things you can do in this space. You can come up with different API designs. You can come up with different approaches to working concurrently. You can try and do different things with I.O. or use exciting new socket flags that the Linux kernel added, because why the hell not? And if you want to try that stuff out, you can't diverge too far from what's already there, or you have to write a brand new HTTP parser all over again. This is really unnecessary overhead, given that, once again, there's really only one correct answer when it comes to parsing an HTTP message. But it gets a bit worse than that, because it causes us to duplicate bugs. HTTP is famously one of those protocols that people think is easy to parse and are tripped up when they discover that that's not actually true. It's terribly difficult to parse. There are lots of mistakes you can make when parsing HTTP, and almost invariably, multiple Python libraries make the exact same mistake because they couldn't learn or build on top of the correct decision made by someone else elsewhere in the ecosystem. This means we all make the same mistakes, and we all look like idiots in the exact same way, and all of this is totally unnecessary. And then on top of all of this, it limits our ability to optimize. The Python community is frequently uh, a bit schizophrenic when it comes to the way we talk about performance. Half the community say that performance is irrelevant because why would we write in Python if we cared about performance? And the other half say that Python is far too slow and we need to drop down to C because parsing is difficult in Python. Leaving aside the possibility that both of these people uh, might be taking a pretty extreme view of the world, there is a truth here, which is that optimizing is hard. And optimizing a specific component is particularly difficult. For example, if you wanted to optimize socket I.O., that turns out to be a remarkably difficult thing to do. I'm certainly not smart enough to optimize socket IO, uh, and I've tried. It's a very specific skill. And that specific kill skill is not shared by most people who are good at writing parsers. Parsers are not like socket calls. For one thing, they mostly don't have to deal with the messy actual network where packets get lost. Packets never get lost in a parser because how could they possibly get lost? It's just a parser. This means that when you tie your I.O. to your parser, you make it very hard for users to optimize I.O. for the case they care about. If you've got a user who wants to send just massive binary files, they want a different approach to I.O. than a user who is doing live streaming of very latency-strict data. They need different things, and when your I.O. is in your parser, it affects what they can actually do and limits them. This limits how effectively they can perform and ends up forcing them to write Go, and then the whole world's just gotten slightly sadder. And that's, that's not what we need as a community. It's not sadder because they had to write Go, by the way. I'm not taking a shot at Go. Go is wonderful. It's sadder because they're not in our community, which is where I would like them to stay. I want as many people in this community as possible, because then I can hide. <laughs> so we have a problem with some costs. They might not be really high costs, but they are costs. The fact that these costs aren't high, by the way, is why we have this problem. If this cost was like, my machine doesn't boot at all because my parser and my I.O. are mixed, we wouldn't have this problem anymore. That's not it. It just causes a low-level technical cost that affects your application from the day you started writing it till the day you give up and decide to become a farmer. <laughs> this is a real problem with a real set of costs. So what are we doing wrong, and how do we avoid the problem? Well, what are we doing wrong is easy, because I've told you the whole way through this talk. Uh, it's don't do I.O. at all, ever. Pure functional programming. That is not the message of this talk. The message of this talk is don't do I.O. in your parsers and state machines. 
when you're tackling a network protocol, or for that matter, a file format, it should be possible for you to pick up a parser for that network protocol or file format and plug it right into your chosen I.O. paradigm. However you've decided to do it, whatever wacky decision you've decided to make, your parser should be able to just be plugged right in with no drama whatsoever. So when, if you are the kind of person who writes parsers, that means you need to keep a big hard wall between your parser and the code that does your I.O. Because the second your I.O. code leaks into your parser, it becomes very, very difficult to reuse that work in a different context. Because this is a coding conference, we should have some code. This is an alternative, better API for building network parsers. And I want to be clear, this is exactly what the API looks like, except you maybe change perform action to something somewhat more specific. You have one function that takes in data from the network. It doesn't care how the data got there. It could have come on a pigeon. It could have been sent on a boat. It doesn't matter. Just some data showed up, and it goes in one end. And out the other end come events. Something happened. In HTTP land, this event can be, I received a request, or I received some data, or the user went away. Whatever happened in the protocol. Then on the other side, you can have one of two things, you can have a number of functions that perform specific events, like send a response. Or you can have one function that takes event objects. Same basic, it's just a, an API design question, they have the same basic effect. But in both cases, what they output, what they return, is more bytes. This library doesn't care how bytes get in or how they get out. It doesn't matter, it's not its problem, they're just R bytes. They're non-specific bytes in an idealized platonic world that is all bytes. Uh, it's it's a, not a fun place to be, but it's a place. And it's not its job to get those bytes onto or off a network. The goal here is that the parser author is gonna let higher level libraries worry about how to get bytes on and off a network. The goal of the parser library is just to understand the bytes, not to worry about how they get there or how they go away. This is obviously not an all-purpose library, right? Like, there are some things in protocols that require more user intervention than this or that are in some way tied to I.O. Uh, a good example in HTTP2 is flow control, which limits how much data a peer can send. Uh, there are ways you might want to control flow control windows. Obviously, a parser should not be deciding that, right? But it should be offering all the handles that need to be pulled in order to make those decisions. Additionally, it should have documentation, because documentation is good, and in that documentation it should say, if you need to do flow control, here's the levers you pull. Then, once you have your nice little HTTP parsing library, got this core implementation, what you do is you wrap it in a higher level library that does do I.O., right? Like, I'm not saying that requests is a bad thing to have, and you should all pick up a parser and learn to write socket calls and do all this stuff. That's obviously crazy. Most people don't have time for that. Requests should exist, and so should AIO HTTP and all these other things. But they should also all have the same common parser at the base of them. You can think of them as having a little tree of things. There's the API on the top, the request's famous API on the top. And then there is a bit that does socket-y stuff, and a bit that does parsing-y stuff, and never the twain shall meet. They go through this little API layer at the top, and then that means that if you care about APIs or if you care about sockets, you can mess about with all of that to your heart's content without ever worrying about, is the parser going to break under my feet? You can build new versions of these things that are better than the janky stuff you've already got without worrying about how the hell does you know, line continuation work in HTTP, because none of you even know that line continuation is a thing in HTTP. And you're going to get it wrong, and that's fine, because we all get it wrong at least once. I got it wrong twice. It's not a big deal. But you don't want to do this and make these mistakes like me, because you're just not going to feel good about it. In this world, requests is a wrapper around a parser, and AIO HTTP is a wrapper around the same parser, but they've got different I.O., they've got different API primitives, AIO HTTP uses yield from, because that's the new hotness, and, and everyone's happy about these things. Everyone gets what they want, but we get fewer bugs, and that's great. So what do you get when you develop this way, aside from fewer bugs, although fewer bugs is huge? The first thing you get is you get libraries that are super easy to test. This turns out to be not immediately obvious to a lot of people. But if you test a library that does I.O., really any I.O. at all, it turns out to be almost impossible to test. This is because 
Because the I.O. is deep in under the library, you have to exercise the I.O. logic in order to exercise the other logic of the program, right? HTTP might care about how long bytes take to show up. And if you're going to test that, now you're also testing your parser as well. You need to send some byte stream in and then pause. You need to make a sleep. You need to do all kinds of other wacky stuff. This is really unpleasant. It leads to all kinds of naughty problems. And if you want to see how unpleasant it is, you should go take a look at URLib3's test cases, which frequently have to do something like this in order to hit weird edge cases in the code. But in this new model, where the parser is self-contained and just handles bytes based on function calls, it is really, really easy to test it thoroughly and extensively. This is from my HTTP2 protocol suite. Uh, this uh, is not the first time I've given this talk. And the last time I gave this talk, I had only 600 tests. Now I have 900 tests, because writing tests for these is just really easy. It's a thing you can do when you're bored in your spare time. Uh, they're super easy to test and hit weird edge cases, because the only weird edge cases in here now just amount to I got byte x, then byte y. That's pretty easy to test. The other advantage you get here is you can have application-specific I.O. again. This is great. Do you know all the socket flags in the socket library? All right, there's one hand up, and I think that guy's lying. <laughs> <laughs> Just most of them. Yeah, well, most of them is already doing pretty well. On top of that, once you know what they are, do you know how to use them correctly? Lots of people think they know how to use, for example, um, the best one being uh, delayed ACK, the delayed ACK flag. No one uses that properly. I've seen code that uses it wrongly because it turns out using it correctly is really hard. And on top of that, your users probably want different flags than you. It's hard to write high-performance I.O. And if you don't have to solve that problem, you shouldn't solve that problem. Because, again, it's hard, and hard stuff is boring. Don't do it. And it's a very different problem than writing a good protocol parser. You don't have to solve both problems at once, and you shouldn't. But the main reason you want to do this is it lets you build a toolbox of really, really great implementations of things. The Python community is a great community, and we have a lot of HTTP things. What we should have is one really excellent HTTP parser that everyone can use. This reduces the amount of bugs we have, which means that we reduce the amount of time developers spend fixing these bugs. This is both developers of the libraries and also developers of the consumers of these libraries who really don't care about HTTP parsing at all. They just want to use the Twilio API so they can make a phone call. It's not interesting to them. We shouldn't be spending time solving this solved problem again and again. And then that means those few developers who do care about protocol parsing can share their work and combine their efforts and get together in increasingly nerdier and esoteric meetings to solve the few remaining problems that they have, which I will greatly enjoy, and you will all greatly enjoy not needing to care about it. It's enormously good. We should let developers worry about their high-level concerns and let developers who care about parsing protocols care about parsing protocols. It lets HTTP library design become about APIs and I.O., rather than about boring, solved problems. As an example of how this stuff looks in real code, uh, I've got two. Uh, the first one is HyperH2. This is an HTTP2 protocol stack. As far as I know, it is still the only Python HTTP2 protocol stack, which means either I did a good job or no one cares about HTTP2. You can take a look at its docs, and its docs talk about exactly how you use a library like this. And you can take a look at its code, and you can see that its code is terrifying and scary, and then you can put the code away, which is something I strongly encourage. A similar project exists for HTTP 1.1, uh, which was written by Nathaniel Smith. I happily had nothing to do with it, so it's inevitably very good. And it's absolutely worth looking into, because it is another way of solving this problem. It demonstrates that this is not an HTTP 2 only solution to this problem. But here's the thing. I'm only one person. Nathaniel is, as far as I know, also only one person. And we have a limited amount of time, and we can only solve this problem in a few spaces and only in a few areas. I personally need help with the HTTP2 side. Nathaniel presumably needs help with the HTTP1.1 side, although, again, if he's multiple people, maybe not. You should check with him first, uh, or them first. But you can also apply this philosophy to a whole set of other problems that aren't HTTP. So if you feel like you want to help out, there are some things you can do. You can, for example, try putting HTTP2 support in your favorite HTTP tool. Alternatively, you can uh, 
think of another protocol or file format that's amenable to this kind of approach and supply a patch to them. See how it goes. I encourage you to take this up, I encourage you to give it a shot, and if you're not convinced by any of this, it is now time for you to ask me some questions. Thank you very much. Great talk, Corey. We have time for a few questions. If you could come to the microphone. Go ahead. You don't get a microphone. It's not for you. <laughs> Is this one on? <laughs> More to your whoa, Jesus. <laughs> More to your point that we should save time uh, as a community. Maybe we could save more time by letting the node community do that work? Uh, what are your thoughts about using, uh, about other communities sharing C libraries because so many languages have C bindings? Uh, so there is definitely some value in doing that. The reason that I get nervous about that is that I really feel like letting untrusted input anywhere near C is usually a bad idea. Uh, <laughs> On the other hand, if some other language communities would like to come and talk about, say, a Rust parsing library, I am much more amenable to that discussion. I'm happy to sit down in a room and see how that goes. But certainly, yes, I think this is broader than just a Python-specific concern. And there are actually, I have written bindings for at least one uh, very, very fast HTTP1 parser um, that is something that I would consider using as well. So you're absolutely right. All right thank uh, you. If I could just add a comment uh, on that also. I'm that's the one, Nathaniel, by the way. Yeah, I, uh, I actually, in H11, I started by wrapping the Node.js parser. It turns out that parsing alone is only a small part of the problem of keeping track of an HTTP one connection state. Like, you have to keep track of the response. There's all these weird things that can happen with upgrades and all that. Um, so as far as I know, there aren't any actual like, libraries you can just drop in that actually do all of that for you. It's just the parser. And I ended up throwing that out because pure Python is actually nicer. And once I had the state machine working otherwise, I could think and I don't know, I don't think I spend pretty much any time in the actual parsing logic. So, but the nice thing about this is you have a nice Python API, you could plug that in. Cool. So the protocol examples that you gave involved protocols that you can handle by reading and writing a linear stream of bytes, and you showed the very simple API for handling that without I.O. Mm -hmm. Is there a sensible API for pulling the I.O. out of a protocol that requires random access to a file, for example, a file format parser? The answer to that is going to be yes, uh, but it's not going to be quite so simple. So necessarily, that API needs to have a much more uh, structured representation of uh, what I called events. So uh, HTTP uh, and HTTP 1 and 2 and all of those things are essentially streams of events that happen one after the other. There is obviously room for having an API that doesn't think about events in terms of streams, but for example, might think of them in terms of trees or in terms of various kinds of, uh, of nested structures. It can definitely be done. It is not the kind of thing that you can just kind of sit at a laptop and YOLO for a while and then <laughs> expect it to work out. You do need to think about it a bit. Uh, but yes, it can be done. Thank you. Hi. So um, love the example in the talk of um, IO uh, over a network versus um, things you do with that IO. It's very clear where to draw that boundary line. Um, I feel like if you take that idea far enough, you basically end up with something like Haskell, like do all your stuff over here and then have your monads over here or whatever they are. Um, where do you, how do you draw that line for other code where it's not so obvious um, or in general, do you, do you think this is a, a good programming paradigm of like do your functional stuff and only have your IO where you need it and an API that ties the two together? Uh, yeah, so the answer is yes, I think that is a good paradigm. Um, cool. Haskell's strictness is not necessarily very friendly, but it's frequently a good idea to make code as 
uh, pure as possible, to have as little mutable state as you can. Um, please don't look inside Hyper H2, it's all mutable state. But <laughs> if I was better at my job, I would have less mutable state, much more immutability, much more purity, because again, it, it further improves all these things we already have. It makes it easier to test. It makes it easier to make guarantees about. Uh, those are all very valuable. Of course, you do then at some point need to actually write to a socket. Uh, but you can definitely learn lessons from the functional paradigm uh, in that place. Hey, um, I feel like there's another problem set that's very similar to uh, HTTP and it's uh, certificate validation for SSL and TLS. Do you know if it's a centralized effort to sort of merge that across all the different projects? Uh, there are, at last count, at least 12 centralized efforts to do that. Uh, I'm a very pragmatic person. Uh, I have to live in the world that there is, and uh, I feel like the the best you can do usually is to use the validation libraries that your OS ships with. So that at least is consistent with everything else on the machine, uh, and you can avoid those wacky problems where you get to say, oh, it works in my browser, but not in anything else. Uh, that's usually the best you can do. So I guess that means, you know, don't use embed TLS to do it, because no one's ever heard of it. You know, stick with the things that are really common. Um, there is a whole separate problem around that on Windows and OS 10 in Python, which uh, if you want to talk about it uh, after this talk where all these other people don't have to hear it. I'm happy to talk about it. I've been doing some work in that space. Thank you. I think we're out of time. If you have any more questions, perhaps you can meet outside. And let's have uh, another big round of applause for Thank you. Very good. Job.